passengers that survived by sex. So um, survived is just a binary variable, 0, 1, 0, 1. We want to do it by, uh, by sex, so we're going to group by sex. And oops. Open paren. So why, does, why does that need to be a string there rather than just the word sex? That is the word sex. You mean without the quotes? Yeah. That would be a Python object called sex that doesn't currently exist. It's a label. It mm, no, that's just a label on a column. So it would be looking for this. An right, but we haven't specified it as an attribute. You mean you mean uh, so you mean Titanic dot sex? Um, I don't know if that works. That's just the way that they uh, implemented. I think. Let's see if that works. Oh, it works. There you go. Fine, we'll do it that way. Somehow, it's somehow translating the word sex. Into that. Yeah, it's yeah. It, and then um, then we're going to. Um, uh, we want to. We're only interested in survived, right? So we're going to index that out. We don't need that period there. And if we want the proportion, all we have to do is take the mean, right? If you think about it, right? Because the mean is just the sum divided by the total. So it'll take all the one, the, all the ones that survived, which are the ones, and divide them by n, which is the proportion. Seventy-two percent survival for females, nineteen percent for males. Okay. How about by class and sex? Well, all we have to do, I'm going to use strings again. Sorry. Is do uh, p class, sex. And what we see is um, you really want it to be in the first class cabin and female. And uh, if you're in the lower cabins, you had trouble. Although 50% of women made it out of third class cabin, which if you watched the movie, didn't look like anybody got out of there. <laughs> okay, and I'll, I'll leave the other one as an exercise because I think we want to move on here. So we have like an hour left. And as I warned you, I didn't know how long things would take. And as I also suggested, I probably, you probably don't want us to blast through everything. So I can either do it in the order that I specified and move on to plotting, reserving whatever's time left over to statistical analysis, or I could invert those and look at statistical analysis and leave you to do plotting more or less on your own. Um, should we have a vote? Who wants uh, statistics first? Who wants plotting first? All right, stats it is. Um, yeah, the plotting stuff is good, uh, and I hope to get to it. But um, uh, I think, given the title of the talk, it would be sad if we didn't get to some of this stuff. All right. So these are going to be lots of, of examples. Um, so the, the other reason that I thought <clears throat> this would be nice is that... Um, there isn't a, a uh, stats models tutorial like there was last year. And um, it may surprise you, actually, if for those of you who are familiar, is I'm actually not going to use stats models very much here. I'm going to try to show you some statistical stuff kind of from first principles. Okay? Stats models is kind of a not quite point and click, but you can automatic analyses. You just pass it some data, and it gives you an analysis whether or not you know what it means or how it did it. I'm going to do things kind of more from first principles here. Okay which I hope is going to be useful. So um, um, if you did take some undergraduate and graduate level uh, statistics, um, most of what you learned is, is the wrong approach, unfortunately. No matter where you, I was a professor in New Zealand before I was at Vanderbilt, and I've seen what happens in England and other countries too. The problem is, is that you usually get a semester of statistics, and you're supposed to learn everything. And unfortunately, to learn the stuff that's really useful, it takes more background than that. So what they do is they teach you things like t-tests and, and chi-squared tests and uh, non-parametric tests 
and maybe an analysis of variance, and maybe even some regression. And it's be mainly because these things are expedient, and you can crank them out in SPSS or SAS with minimal training. And um, uh, unfortunately, there, there are major limitations to, to this approach. And it, and it often isn't a very informative way to do statistical analysis. So um, what I would consider a modern approach to statistical analysis is one that um, uses what we would call statistical modeling. So attaching your data to some model of the real world and, and seeing how well uh, that fits. And, and from that, you get estimates for things that you uh, want to learn, uh, uh, estimates of things about which you want to learn, okay? Estimates of the effect of a treatment, estimates of uh, distance from the Earth to uh, a body somewhere. Uh, who knows, what, whatever your uh, field uh, is you, you, you generally want to be estimating things rather than testing whether two things are different or not because two things are usually different. It's a matter of how different. Um, so what I'm going to do here is teach you how to build some statistical models with the aim of, of being able to estimate quantities of interest. So let's start with estimation. What is estimation? Well, uh, what, what it is, is is being able to find estimates of parameters that correspond to the distribution that best represents our data. So we've all heard of things like normal distributions, right? That bell curve, and uh, you know it's got a mean and a variance. Those are its parameters. So mu and sigma square in this case, and um, and it has certain properties, and it's completely defined, specified by those those two uh, parameters. And it's very good for things that don't vary very much. You know, very few extreme values and things that are, are uh, distributions that are um, uh, symmetric about some mean. So here's you know, some fake data here. And what, what is that? I don't know what that is. We, so we need to find a statistical model and try to fit that data to it and, and, and there, thereby be able to get some inference about what's underlying it. So how do we fit data to probability distributions? Well, you can use a, a fit function within SciPy, but that really doesn't teach you how to do it, and it doesn't, and it, it's only there for some of the more famous uh, variables. It's not there for some other things that you might want to use. There are two really good ways of doing this. <clears throat> One is called the method of moments, and this involves um, choosing parameters so that the sample, mo so a moment is our, our expected values of things. So the expected value of a variable is the first moment. And the ex expected value of the second moment is it's the expected value of the variable squared. And a function of the variable squared is the variance. So in general, the variance is associated with the second moment, and the means associated with the first moment. So to estimate a normal distribution via the method of moments is you take your sample mean and variance, which you can just calculate, and correspond those to the, the theoretical ones if that was its true distribution. The second one is maximum likelihood, which involves setting up a likelihood function corresponding to that distribution, and then finding the values of the parameters that maximize that function. So it's a bit of an optimization problem. And I'll take you through both of those here, okay? So <clears throat> for those of you with a, a minimal uh, uh, background in statistics, just some fundamentals here as I clear my toolbars again. Oops, I just put them back. There we go. Um, two general types of random variables, one that's discrete, so things that are countable, right? True, false, yes, no, are binary and discrete. Integers, discrete, you guys that know this stuff already, right? And, uh, and, a, and a distribution for a, a discrete variable is called a probability mass function. So the, there are probabilities for variables that are you know, integer valued here, but there's no probability for things in between, so they're just point masses at each value. Right? So we, say, we can say things about what's the probability that big X is some particular value, little x, and we apply some function to it. And this happens to be a Poisson distribution, which is a, a uh, distribution that's used to model counts, counts of things. How many people use an ATM in, uh, in, an, in an hour on a busy street? How many cars pass a particular spot? How many, how many um, bats? per square mile in Austin, Texas, okay, counts of things. Um, and so, you know, it's got one parameter. So the probability that x equals some value x is e to the power of negative lambda, and lambda is the parameter, and then x is the value of the, of the any particular uh, 
variable that's Poisson distributed. So e to the negative lambda, lambda to the power of x divided by x factorial. And you tend to get things that look like this. They tend to be uh, sort of bowl-shaped, um, particularly as you move away from the zero, because they can only, they're counts, so they can only be positive. Okay, and, the, and the, there's only one parameter, and it describes both the mean and the variance. So as the mean gets bigger, the variance gets bigger, as counts generally do. Okay? And then continuous are for everything else, so things that are continuously measured, blood pressure, right? um, uh, levels of ultraviolet radiation, um, anything you can think of. And it could be you know, on a 0, 1 scale, it could be like a probability between 0 and 1, continuous, or it can be you know, on the whole real line from negative to positive infinity. And so here's a, uh, that's not a normal distribution. That's an exponential distribution, but it looks sort of similar to the Poisson, but it's a, a continuous function, so it's defined between the values one and two, all right? And, and so we have to use calculus to find these probabilities. Um, but the normal distributions, you know, the most famous and most important distribution, and this, you know, again, describes things like, you know, distributions of test scores, distributions of heights and things like that tend to be um, normally distributed. They have a mean and a variance, and that's the function. Okay, we're going to use that function later when we um, use maximum likelihood. So let's use um, an, a, some, a sample data set here, uh, some rainfall data, which is very easy to get. You can go to NOAA and download a whole bunch of text files that include <clears throat> rainfall. So this is from 1891 through to, I think it's 2011 for this one. And the uh, rainfall... Uh, I assume in millimeters, um, could be inches, um, since then for every month. So it's this square uh, table, and so we're doing read table um, because it's not comma separated, it's white space delimitered. And, um, and we can, well, I didn't show you any of this plotting stuff, but um, the, the plotting in, in pandas is very high level, unlike matplotlib. Uh, you, you, so there's things like hist, which generates a histogram um, as a, a method, not a function, of a data frame. And you can specify a few options, like whether I want them to, it, because there are more, multiple columns, it's going to do a histogram for every column. And so I want this one to share x-axis and share y-axis so that I can compare them. If they have different scales, I won't be able to compare them. And, uh, and then for some reason, they put this grid that I hate on it. So I, I do grid equals false. And then tight layout makes, sometimes you do a plot with matplotlib, or most of the time, and the labels overlap and stuff on these multi-gridded ones. And tight layout will pick a nice optimal um, layout here. So here we get distributions over all years for every month. Okay, So we, you know, we can see how much rain we get in a, in a particular month. It's not terribly interesting, but it's good for an example. So what sort of distribution do we fit to these? Yes? So what's the underscore equals for? Oh, uh, that's just a convention. It, it's because this, um, when you call hist, it uh, returns a plot object. I think it returns a set of axes. And if I don't do that, it'll just print this big, ugly object. Or, oh, it doesn't do it there. Never mind. It will. I swear I do them for some of them, and it gives me the printout. But never mind. Ignore that. Uh, underscore is just a throwaway variable, so I assign things that I don't need to it so that they don't print out here. Um, so what, what distribution am I going to use here? Well, th these are the, this is where statistics becomes an art as much as a, a science. Um, it be you have to be sort of familiar with the models that you might want to fit, and here's where I'll give you a little bit of help. Um, normal's probably not a good idea, right? Why? Because uh, the, this can't just be described by a mean and a variance. These tend to be skewed, right? These are, have longer tails over here. Mainly, and also, they have to be positive. You can't have negative rainfall, not even in Texas. <laughs> and uh, so we want something that is continuous. We want something that is, has some sort of skewability to it. And so I'm going to suggest the gamma distribution. And gamma distributions look like this. They, they're very flexible. The more parameters you have on a statistical model, the more flexible they become. That's the form of the gamma distribution. All you really need to know is that it has two parameters, a shape and a scale parameter. 
alpha and beta or A and B. And so they can look sort of normally, you know, normal-esque and dome sh and bell-shaped, but then they can also look kind of skewed like that. Or if they're up, up close against zero, they can be, they can be slopey, okay? So I, I'm, you know, just looking at that and looking at that. Yeah, I think I can fit some of those on some of those. So I'm going to pick a gamma distribution, okay? It's a choice I've made. And so let's use the method of moments. Well, um, for those of you not familiar with the gamma distribution, its mean is alpha times beta, and its variance is alpha times beta squared. You can just look that up on Wikipedia or wherever. No need to memorize it. And, uh, and so all we do is we take the, um, the sample mean and variance and make them equivalent to those values, two equations, two unknowns, and we can solve for them. If we solve for them, then our best value for alpha is the mean squared over the variance. So <clears throat> just as a statistical convention, the uh, mean is usually x, the bar, x bar is the mean value. And then uh, s is the, is the sample theoretical variance. So that's why I've put this equation here. So a little hat means an estimate. So an estimate of the variance is s squared, which is alpha times beta squared. So alpha is, x, x is the mean divided by the variance, and the beta is the variance divided by the mean, not squared. Um, one thing that we have to deal with here is there is one single missing value. I don't know what happened one of these Octobers, but there's an NA value in here. And I'm going to fill this value. We know how to do that in pandas now. Fill NA. And I'm, I'm just going to use um, the mean. Makes sense, right? Just assume that like, it's some mean month. Then it won't influence you won't, don't want to set it to zero, right? <laughs> um, so we, we're just going to set it to mean, and we just do a quick check here, 141 non-null values. So we don't have any, miss, any missing data. And then we you know, do our calculations. So here's the mean. And by default, it's, um, it's um, by column. So it gives you the column means and the column variances. So precip.var, precip.mean. And these are, again, convenience functions. I could have used apply. Um, but they're used so often that uh, Wes included them as, as methods. And then here's our calculations. So the mean squared over the variance and the variance over the mean. And those are the parameter values, alpha and beta. So for January, it's 2.95 and 1.53, et cetera. Okay. And so now we can use our gamma distribution. Let's, fit, let's see what they look like. So uh, SciPy stats distributions contains a pretty exhaustive set of distributions that have all of the statistical functions that you need for them. And what we're looking for is this PDF, probability distribution function. Right? And um, so what we're going to do is we're going to create hist our histograms as before, and then we're going to plot on top of those um, our estimated PDF. So this is just a gamma PDF with method of moments alpha, method of moments beta. And so this is for January. And that's what it looks like. Does it fit? I don't know. So you, we'll, we could do some sort of goodness of fit test on that. We won't do that here. But um, it generally does the trick, right? It hits a peak here, and then it tails off. But you, you, know, you sort of underestimate things here and kind of overestimate things here. So maybe it's not gamma distributed. Um, and then for other months, we can we can put this in a, a spiffy little um, uh, a loop here. So if we, so here, see, so now here I call hist and I get something back. Why, is it, why does it work for hist here? Anyway, I get a, a set of axes back. I want them to be more normalized so that they're proportions rather than counts. But it's precip.hist that's giving me this. And I'm getting a set of axes. So I'm getting that same grid that I got up here. Precip hist. Yeah, that's later. But up this first line here, I'm saying this one here. No, I'm calling hist here. See, precip dot hist. No, before I did precip dot hist too. This. Precip hist. Yeah. Oh, was it because I called tight layout afterwards? Yeah. And where you got the alpha, you got the 
There's what I was looking for. It's because I called tight layout. It only prints out the last thing. That's right. So anyways, I'm, I want those now, and I'm getting them. Where are they? Here they are. And so I'm going to loop over those axes, and on each of the axes, I'm going to pull out the month, which is in the title. And then I'm going to pull out the, uh, and I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to ravel them. So raveling takes things that are multidimensional and stretches them out. And then I'm going to apply the alphas and betas from each of my estimates. And then I'm even going to print a label that shows what, they, what the values are. So we get this. So that's pretty cool. So you estimated a whole bunch of stuff all in one, all in one go, and you, and you can visualize the output. And you can see in some months it fits better, uh, better than others. It doesn't work on yours. Yeah, no, it right, right. Huh. Big size. I'm using for this. I'm using pandas 0 0.11.1. 0 .1. So yeah, some. It's 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 worth if you can being on the latest and greatest pandas because it moves pretty fast. They. Develop, gets developed pretty fast, and most of the time they fix more problems than they introduce, like any good <laughs> software package, right? So you generally want to be compiling from GitHub. Um, if, you're on, if you're on a Mac, by the way, and you're running Lion, I, I build a package called the SciPy Super Pack that takes most of these, most of these key uh, packages from the scientific stack, and I build them a couple times a month, and I make them available. If you look for SciPy Super Pack, but you have to be running the latest Mac, OS, yeah, OS 10, unfortunately. Um, so I like to stay on the cutting edge of some of these because you, you get lots of bug fixes and, and you get some new functionality. But the course, I was saying to somebody out in the hall before, the core stuff hasn't changed very much. The group, all the group buys and all the slicing and all the hierarchical fancy indexing, that hasn't changed. What changes are the ni little niceties, right? Uh, you know, the, the convenience functions, that, you know, uh, names for arguments get a little more sensible. That, that's all. So you don't feel too bad if you... Mine said get 0 0.11.1. <laughs> Maybe for somebody else's course, but not for mine. No. There certainly is. I'm running it. Oh yeah, you gotta yeah, you gotta build it from GitHub. Oh, GitHub's got twelve now. And I said greater than or equal to zero point eleven point. So you could be get doing stuff I'm not. So yeah, I apologize. Sort of. Okay. Um, all right. Maximum likelihood. So that's so that's one way of doing things. Um, Maximum likelihood I showed you before. So this one is this one is uh, a little bit uh, more robust approach to estimation. So maximum likelihood. Um, there's a lot of theory behind it, and I'm not going to tell you all of the theory. There's lots of books on it. I'm going to kind of show you the mechanics of it. Um, so the idea here is that we we have some data, and uh, that data we say is distributed according to some function, like we did with method of moments. Okay. So for example, let's get that Poisson distribution from before, and I'm going to randomly sample 100 values from it, OK? And um, so if we take each of those values and we plug it into the Poisson distribution with a particular parameter value, so I sampled this with a, from a Poisson with parameter value 5. Remember, there's only one value, and that's the mean and the variance. And as you can see, the mean is about 5, and the variance, well, it's hard to visualize variance, but the variance is about 5, OK? And, uh, if you take um, each of those values and you plug them into the Poisson distribution with parameter value equal to 5 and you multiply them together, that's a measure of how likely that value is, 5 in this case, or whatever value we want for lambda, is conditional on the data. So you, and that's the question we usually have, right? Here's all my data. What's, my, what's the mean? What's the parameter for this distribution? Well, there's, it could be all sorts. You, haven't, you don't know what the truth is, OK? Um, conditional on the data. Conditional. What's the parameter value? Conditional on the data. That's what we're interested in. Yeah. That's what it is, though. So here's what the likelihood function looks like for the Poisson distribution. 
So notice I say, yeah. So the likelihood of y for a particular, you can look at it two different ways. So you notice the likelihood function looks exactly like the probability distribution function, looks exactly the same. The only difference is that um, this is a function of the parameters and the probability distribution function is a function of the data. So it depends on which one we're holding constant here. So I'm gonna show it to you, I'm gonna visualize it. You don't have to conceptualize it. So, so for any value, like I said, we can calculate its likelihood. So here's the Poisson likelihood, all written out. I didn't even use the one in SciPy, okay? And um, yeah, so say I pick lambda equals six and say I've observed 10 things. So the likelihood of that is 0 0.04. Don't try to interpret it, it's not a probability, okay? And um, in that data set from above, if I sum over this Poisson likelihood for all of that data, um, that's the likelihood. Say I change the value from, what is it? Six to eight, went down. Well, that makes sense because the true value was five because I simulated it. So six is more likely than eight, right? That makes sense. Uh, you're summing over all of the values of the data. So every value of the data, see what this loop is for? For every y i in y, I'm calculating the Poisson likelihood and summing it. Remember I showed up here, you know. Oh, sorry, you know why I summed it? Because, um, oh, shit, yeah, I should have pro product, sorry. I, I'm sp I should really use, um, Damn it. I wonder why prod does that and sum doesn't. Um, I should really use, um, that's OK. I should really use, um, we like to work in, in the log space. That's why I summed. I'm used to working in the log space. Um, Jeep. Oh, it's because lamb didn't change here. Boom. There we go. OK. More likely than that, okay? Yeah, I wanted that to be the log likelihood. Never mind. Um, shouldn't be. Oh, uh, yeah, put, it, put, a, put brackets around this. It didn't, for some reason, sum works with a, a generator and prod doesn't in NumPy. Don't know why. So just put brackets around the comprehension there. And in fact, we can plot the likelihood function for any value of the parameters. So for that data, here's the likelihood of different values. And what we probably want is the one that maximizes it, right? The most likely value, given the data. Different than the PDF, by the way. Here's the PDF. The PDF is discrete, right? It's only defined for certain values, integer values. The likelihood function's continuous, because it's defined over lambda, which is so one, we're looking at the data. The other, we're looking at the parameters of the same function. Scroll that way, that way. What did I do here? Poisson like one x one for i l and lambdas. I guess so. Let's see. Poisson like boom, 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 boom. And you're not getting that plot? No, that plot is not the same. So it's like, you know, the value for lambda is what three is the one that plot. Do, 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 do. Oh, um, here I'm not taking the product. So I'm, I'm taking a particular value of x. Sorry. That's why. This is just for, here's our data for this plot. x equals 5. See what I mean? These values are for the whole data set that I just simulated. Sorry for being confusing. This y is, the, is this data here. This fake data. This plot down here is just for the value of five, the data, our, our value is five. We observed five things. How is it distributed? What Poisson distribution did it come from? Well, uh, five, <laughs> right. That's, that's the most likely value. It should be. Should be right in the middle area. It is pretty likely. It's the most likely value. It's right here. Right here. 
No, these aren't probabilities. These are likelihoods. These are probabilities. This is the probability that x is equal to a particular value of x given lambda equal to 5. So those are probabilities. Those are not. Those are likelihood values, OK? So why do we care, right? Who cares? Um, so the reason we care is that, well, one reasonable, one objective way of measuring, of picking a value, is to pick the one that maximizes the likelihood function. So we turn our inference into optimization. And we all know how to do optimization, right? You're all physicists and things. So, um, so let's go back to this rainfall data. Um, we like to work in the log scale here for a number of reasons, just numerically, obviously. We don't want to work in powers of e to the negative 122. Um, so we're taking the log. So here's the log likelihood of the gamma, summing them. And so little, I'm going to use little l to represent the log likelihood. Okay, and that reduces to this. Could reduce it down to this, which is a bunch of. It's easier also to work in summary statistics. So I'm taking the mean of the logs and the means and things like that. Okay. So how do we find the MLE of things? Well, how do we find maximums of stuff? We take the first derivative, right? Apologies to those who don't remember calculus, but you take the first derivative, which shows what the slope is at every point. And the point we want is where the slope is zero, where it's a flat line. And the only place here that that exists is up at the top, the maximum. So we take the derivative, we set it to zero, and we solve for it. Okay, Optimization. Yeah, these are all unimodal distributions that we're using. Yeah. But good point, though. Your zeros can be at minima, and then they can also be uh, multiple humps. Hmm? Um, it probably gets close, but I don't think it gets exactly to zero. It's probably not defined as zero because it's the end point. Yeah. All right. Um, so finding the MLE. Again, a little bit of math. So we take the first derivative, set it equal to 0. And, um, uh, with, and you got to do it twice, once with respect to beta, one, once with respect to alpha. And uh, so this can be solved. So it ends up that beta is equal to alpha divided by uh, the mean. But if you plug that back into here, um, we get this, which has no closed form solution. So what we have to do is numerical optimization. And what numerical optimization algorithms do is they take an initial guess at the solution and they iteratively improve that guess until it gets close enough to the answer. And what we are going to use is the Newton-Raphson algorithm, which takes this initial value and it subtracts the function evaluated at a particular value divided by its, its derivative, which is actually available to us as the Newton function in SciPy Optimize. And if you need a, a bit of a visualization, it kind of looks like this. Right? So let's say this is our initial guess. What ends up happening is that we, it ends up being the tangent to that line. And we take that line until it intersects 0. And that's our new point. And then we do the same thing here. We'll take another line here, and it'll end up somewhere over here. And then we'll do it again. And it will slowly, well, actually quickly, converge to that 0 point. Or not. For a gamma function, it, it will. I pick picked uh, them intentionally, OK? And so what we need here are two, two functions. We need, the, um, we need the, um, this derivative of the gamma distribution. So we need the first derivative and the second derivative, as it turns out. So first derivative, um, because that's our function that we're minimizing, and then the derivative of the derivative, which is the second derivative. And so these are the functions. And you can look these up, right? There's, just because you don't know these doesn't mean you can't use them. So, Here's the gamma distribution, the first derivative. So th this function is just what I've written out over here. That's this. You can verify that on your own. And then this is the second derivative, dl2 gamma. OK? All right. And so all we need are the statistics, so the mean and the mean log. OK? And then we can get our MLE for the alpha for December. So we're taking December. So we're taking the log means. The minus 1 is the, you know, the last one. And we're passing it DL gamma. Here, let me, let me always do this, right? So the Newton function takes the function you're trying to optimize, our initial guess, which I'm just going to say is 2. For I can pick anything I want. And then F prime, it needs the, the derivative, which is the 
in the case of the second derivative, and then the arguments for the functions that we, we're using here. So we need log mean and mean log. Right? We, need, uh, we need log mean and mean log. Okay? And we do that and we get 3.51. Okay? And then we just plug that back into the, into the formula for beta and we get an estimate for beta as well. So there we go, alpha and beta. And now we can compare the fit of the estimates derived by MLE to those with the method of moments. And so in this case, method of moments is the magenta solid line, and the MLE is the dotted red line. About the same in this case, okay? MLE tends to have better properties, so we like it. You say, why would you want to do all that optimization stuff? Well, MLEs generally are, have better properties than the method of moments, so that's why we do them. Um, and as it turns out, you don't have to do any of this yourself for, for the gamma because, lo and behold, the gamma in SciPy stats has a fit which actually does maximum likelihood estimation. And you'll notice that it actually gives us exactly the same values. But the problem is, for some reason, the gamma distribution that they use in SciPy is a weird three-parameter version, so it's not directly comparable. Wah, wah, wah. has some location parameter that is... I've you know, hardly ever seen. Right. So why do why do we have to do the, be able to do this by hand? Well, um, yeah, these things aren't always prepackaged for data that's distributed uh, the way that our our real data is, which all, isn't often just some you know standard form like a normal. For example, let's take uh, say we have a truncated distribution. So this is a truncate a distribution like a normal, but conditional that all the values are greater than some value or less than some value, okay? So for example, um, some cut point alpha, or sorry, A, okay? And um, if we want a truncated distribution, the way that we calculate it is take the non-truncated distribution and divide it by the um, condition on the fact that everything's greater than, than A. So capital F is, is what's known as the cumulative distribution function. So it's all the probability up to and including A and we want the inverse of that, so one minus that value. So we're essentially conditioning the original variable on the, um, on the uh, fact that it's observed to be over, always over some value A. So what if we want to fit an MLE on a, um, a truncated distribution? And how do we generate truncated distributions? Here's one way of doing this in Python. So let's say we want a, uh, a normal distribution that is um, truncated at negative one, so it's always greater than negative one. Well, the way we can simulate this is simulate nor regular old normals, and we'll do 10,000 of them, and, um, and then we iteratively update the values that are less than A. So we're going to figure out how many of them are too small, i.e. smaller than A, and then we are going to, in a while loop, uh, re take more samples of size A small, X small, and substitute them until they're all gone. Okay. Maybe come up with more efficient ways of doing it than that, but that's what I'm doing. Okay, and you, as you can see, this is our distribution. That may you get truncated distributions all the time, and you're stuck unless you're able to do things like this. Okay. All right. So, what's our log likelihood? Well, here is our uh, here is what the likelihood looks like. It's the likelihood of the normal over 1 minus the cumulative distribution of the, of the normal. And so here's the same function here for truncated normal. So I'm going to pull, get my norm PDF out of here, and, um, and, we're going to, and this is on the log scale. So it's negative log of the PDF of x at um, theta 1 and theta, theta naught and theta 1. And so those are the mean and the, and the variance of those distributions. Because I just want to pass in, for the optimization algorithm, I just want one object that contains both the parameters rather than having two parameters, okay? So it's the PDF divided by one minus the CDF. So norm has, if you look at norm, I guess I have to import this first. All these distributions in SciPy have uh, a whole bunch of, of uh, functions, percent point function, simulating random variables, the survival function, yeah, you look up any, vari any random variable on Wikipedia, it gives you a list of what the, all these different functions are. And what we're interested in is the PDF 
and the CDF. Okay. No, it's cumulative. CDF is the integer from negative infinity to a integral, or x will say f, integral. So f, big F of x, is the integral from negative infinity of x to b. Let me do a there. I've been confusing. So it's that. So if we are conditioning on being above some value a, I want one minus that. So it's a zero. Okay. All right. So that's the function. Um, I'm going to use a different optimization algorithm, and there's a whole bunch in sci-fi. It's great. Uh, you can select which whichever your favorite uh, optimization algorithm is, and you can usually uh, get an answer. Um, th in this case, we're going to use the Nelder, what's called the nelder mead simplex algorithm. And what, what the nice thing about it is we don't have to calculate derivatives of things, which is nice for the normal distribution. And, um, and it also uh, works on a vector of parameters, whereas Newton doesn't. And here we have two parameters. Remember Poisson, we only had one parameter. Now we have two. So I'm, I'm, uh, it's simultaneously optimizing the mean and the variance. Okay? Um, in SciPy, this, this function is called fmin. And so all I have to do is pass it trunk norm, guess initial guesses at its value, and, uh, and, then, and then the arguments, which is the cut point, which is minus 1, and our data, which is x. Okay? And it iterates through until it finds a mean of 0, close to 0, and a variance of close to 1, which is what we sampled from, except that it's truncated at 1. Okay? So we can do MLE with arbitrary functions, as long as you can get its as long as you can write down its log likelihood, that's all it takes, and then you can do this with it. Okay. Uh, in some cases, um, we may not really be interested in the parameters of a distribution, but we may want to simply uh, see, get a smooth representation of you know, jagged data, sort of smooth it out, see what it would look, see what it probably looks like in general. And, um, in this case, we're doing things what was called non-parametrically. There aren't any parameters to what we're trying to estimate. And one, one way of doing this is using what's called kernel density estimation. So let's just take some fake random data. Just took random numbers, multiplied them by 10. Okay? So they range from 0 to 10. It's just so I can plot it nicely. And what uh, kernel density estimation does is it, for every point in the, uh, in the data, it gives it a little, little normal distribution of some, some size that you can specify that's centered on each data point. So you see all these little humps? And then it simply sums those humps. And that's the distribution of this data. And, and you can specify this smoothing parameter that smooths it more or less depending on. So I set it to 0 0.4. Let's try to boost it to 1. Smoother. Okay, if I go lower, like 0.1, it's essentially, you know, like that. So there's a matter of optimizing what this value uh, ought to be. Okay? And all it's changing is the variance on these normals, right? Um, SciPy, again, don't have to do this by hand, don't want to. Um, there's, a KD, there's a KDE function in, in SciPy that does this. So let's take a bimodal distribution, something that's weird, right? So I've sampled from a normal with mean 0 and variance 3, or standard deviation 3, and then one from a mean 4, variance 1 thingy, and then just concatenated them together. So this is sort of bimodal. Let's make, make it look more bimodal. Let's sample it again. Yeah, there you go. Got a hump down here, hump down here. Uh, I don't know. You can't see it very well. But it's, the point is it's a mixture of two distributions, so, and we don't know what they are. So we just do KDE, Gaussian KDE. And then we specify, um, what do we specify? Nothing. It uses an optimization algorithm to figure out what the, what the best value is, although you can override it, I believe, with your own. BW, yeah, BW methods. So there, there's a couple different names of methods, or you can give it a value. You can give it BW equals 4, and it will use value 4. OK. So. Um, 
Um, I'll, I'll leave this as an exercise for you as well. This uses that cervical dystonia analysis. And what we want to be able to do is, um, and I'll, I'll post the answers to all these exercises too. I'll put it on the GitHub repo uh, so you can check them. Um, so what if you, you, know, you look at the distributions of those twisters values for, d does this treatment work? So this, this is the measure of the disease uh, placebo. This is the distribution of the disease with a high dose. This is with a moderate dose. And you can see that you know, it's sort of filling in at the lower end. It looks like maybe a little bit, but it doesn't do, obviously it doesn't work for everybody. Okay, and so what you might want to do is fit a distribution to each of these and see, see how different they are. Yeah. Right. Um, I'm glad we got to this. Uh, regression models. So it, often when you're doing statistical analysis, you want to relate one set of variables to another set of variables. You're not just interested in the distribution of one. And, and so, for example, whether a medical intervention is actually influential. You know, what's twisters as a function of our intervention? Uh, or, um, you know, how a baseball player's performance varies as a function of age or drugs. And, uh, and so you could, you could model these, uh, these things, right? And so, so this is what the, a, a regression model looks like. So we model our responsive variable y. I guess I better evaluate this. So there's some data, made up data. What's the relationship between x and y here? Is it curved? Is it a curved relationship? Is it straight? Um, so let's, let's do that. So y, y-axis, is a function of the variable here. And so we're going to come up with a model for f of x. But there's, a, always a, there's usually a difference between what the model predicts and what you actually see. And so we add this other term, which is the error. Epsilon is usually the error. So it's the difference between what the model predicts and what, what you observed in the, in the real world. Okay. So, and f can be any function you want. So this is simple linear regression. So there's an intercept. So if x was 0, it's just some mean, mean value. And then some value that relates our x variable to y. So and we call this a slope and an intercept. So it's wh whether the line tilts up or down, and then where it intercepts the, uh, z the 0, the y-axis. All right. So how do, we, how do we fit? How do we get values for the slope and intercept? How do we know what that line looks like? Well. Um, one uh, criterion we can use is to see how different our predicted value is from the observed value summed up over all of the data points, right? We want, on average, to be as small as possible. And actually, here we're going to square them. We're going to square them for two reasons. One, so negative and positive values don't cancel each other out. And also, it has a secondary effect of making more extreme differences. It penalizes them even more. So you really don't like outlier values. We're, and this is called the uh, method of least squares, or the sums of squares. Okay? So we're summing the squares, and we want them as po small as possible. So optimization again, right? We're minimizing again. We want the values for out, beta naught and beta 1 that minimizes that function. So it's like an objective function. Okay? So here's our sum of squares, right? y minus our model squared, summed them up, there you go. And so what's the sum of squares for parameters 0 and 1? It's 333. Not meaningful, except in a relative way, right? If I put negative 1 in here, I get a different value. Oops, got bigger. So we want to minimize that, right? So we can put that into our Nelder Mead thing, right? Initial guess, 0 and 1. And it optimizes, takes it 79 iterations, and it gets to an intercept of negative 4 and a slope of 3. And so what does this look like? That. Looks pretty good, right? And the reason it's good is because it's minimizing this vertical distance in every case. Can't get a better one if that's your criterion. But that's not the only criterion we could use. What if we didn't care to overly penalize um, big differences? Well, we could use it. We could do the same thing except use the sum of absolute differences. So rather than squaring it, we take the absolute value. So it has the effect of not 
negating positive and negative values, but it, but it doesn't overly penalize uh, big values. And so we have S abs. So now I'm taking the absolute value rather than squaring it. Otherwise, it's exactly the same. And I get a different model, mean of 0 and a, slope, a much lower slope of 2.3. So if we compare them, so basically this value here is being very influential here. It's pulling that, pulling that line up, whereas here, it's happy for it to be a little bit farther away because look, everybody else is really, really close now. Okay. So it's another choice to make. Which, which method? Uh, there's, uh, the, the short answer to that is p-values aren't 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 valuable statistical tools. It's again what you learn in in your stats course, but it doesn't tell you anything meaningful. And I can explain it over beer if you want. But I'm not a p-value. Uh, what does the p-value tell you? It gives you a, it would give you a test of whether the slope of that line is different from zero. Well, you get estimates. You get estimates of these values. The, the important things are these numbers right here. Oops. I'm not going to turn text to speech. Um, the, these numbers and then some estimate of uncertainty around those. That's what you really want is a confidence interval around them, not a p-value. Those are the important things. That's what you need. We're estimating things here. We're not saying it's something different than another. It's what's the slope? And, and the slope is 2.3, but that's just an estimate. So how good is our estimate? We want an estimate of variance associated with that. And that's beyond the scope of this course, but we can do that too. Uh, you just need an S. There's an estimator for the variance. So these are these sums of squares are an estimator or the maximum likelihood estimator for the the slope and the and the uh, intercept. Well, there are also maximum likelihood estimators for the variance of that. It's just another formula. All right. So, but you know, we're not restricted to straight line regression models. What uh, what if we think it's curved? So what we can do is add what's known as a polynomial term. So we take x and we square it. We add another parameter for that. Okay, and so now it's a three-parameter model. Okay, so it looks like that. Okay, it allows us to curve. The more parameters you have, the more wiggly you can make your line, essentially. Okay, is that a better model? I don't know. How about uh, how about a third-order, or actually a second-order polynomial? Second or third-order polynomial. Then we could. Oh, sorry, I used a bigger data set for this just to make it look. So, you know, we could do, you know. This is, what is this? This is, um, oh, this is the baseball. This is uh, uh, home runs and RBIs. So what, you know, what if here are uh, home runs and how many, and how many RBIs do you get? Or obviously, the more home runs you hit, the more runs you're going to bat in, but is it necessarily a monotonically increasing function? You know, probably not here. And of course, you know, like we said, we don't need to do any of this by hand. So this is where stats models comes in. Stats models has an OLS object that you can use to fit a relationship between X and Y, and you get a pretty printed table with, hey, look, p-values and things. P-values, really small. You can publish them now. OK. And uh, that's the biggest measure of a p-value. That's what measures is probability of publication. OK. And uh, there's even a really nice. Um, interface using a package called Patsy, which um, allows you to write formulas instead of plugging in variables. So we're saying y is a function of x plus x squared. We want to look at that one. And so we get estimates of, and you'll notice they're exactly the same as the ones that I calculated here. Negative 11, 6.05 minus 0.3, and I get exactly the same thing here because I used exactly the same method. It's ordinary least squares. Yeah. Um, is there any reason that you imported your data rather than taking all the stats off the plot and then plotting it in the um, the, um, so, um, and again, this is partly because we didn't get to the plotting stuff, but the plotting in the data frame <clears throat> that our methods of the data frame are higher level, so uh, you can't do as much with them out of the box, but they generally generate nicer plots. 
Uh, so if you, if you need to do more fine-tuned, um, yeah, so in this case, yeah, I could have just done uh, the data frame and then plot home. Oh, in fact, there's no, here's why. In this case, there's no scatter plot as a method in pandas. So you can do bar plots, you can do histograms, you can do box plots, you can't do scatter plots. So you have to go back to matplotlib. And you'll see in Wes's book, um, in the plotting section, most of it is matplotlib plots and not pandas. And they're quickly adding more and more stuff to pandas plotting because it's really nice, but it doesn't do everything. So good question. Um, that's not very useful. So last, last topic, and then I think we have to wrap it up, um, is, and that is, um, so we've got three models, or however many models. How do we choose which one is best? OK, so if we go back here, is that a better model? Or is that a better model? Or is that a better model? How do we do that? So this is a question of model selection, right? How do we choose among competing models for a given data set? So, um, and just, you know, is that a good fit? That's a ninth order polynomial, okay? It's not good, right? It's not good, why is it not good? Because we really don't believe that the expected value for seven is up here, right? It's good because it kind of tries to go through every point almost exactly we add more, we can you know, maybe make them do even crazier things. But the idea is that it fits really well to this data set, but we're not really interested in this data set. We're interested in the generating model, right? That we're interested in nature. And so we really want something that predicts you know, these values in here somewhere and those values in there. But is it, you know, is it curved or is it not curved? So the more parameters you add, the, wiggly, the tighter your fit gets, but the worse it does at predicting outside your, your, um, your data set. So one method we can use is uh, uh, what's called an information theoretic criterion. That one is called AIC, aka EK's information criterion. And what it does is it balances the fit of the model in terms of the likelihood with the number of parameters required to get there. Okay? So, you get, so as you add parameters to your model, if I wanted to model um, um, how much beer I drink tonight as a function of, how much beer somebody drank as a function of their age, um, and I want to add covariates to it, the more covariates I added to that model, the better the model fit will get, irrespective of what those covariates are. Okay, when you add parameters to a model, the likelihood never goes down, it can only stay the same or go up. All right, so you can add the value of the stock market, you can add the, the arrival times of buses in Austin, you can write anything you want, and that will always go adding, can never get a lower likelihood by adding parameters, okay? So we wanna be able to penalize this. So we got, a f so <clears throat> what the ASC does is tries to minimize the variance of the estimator, and then it gets penalized for the number of parameters that it adds. So every parameter is, you add two points of ASC, but this one's gonna go down. And so we wanna pick the value with the lowest AIC. And this is easy to calculate, because Sigma, sigma squared hat is just the residual sums of squares, which we've just calculated with those functions, uh, divided by a factor here. And then we can always count the number of parameters that we add. Okay, so to apply AIC for model selection, we simply calculate AIC for each model and pick the one with the lowest AIC value. So here it is. So N, that's the, how, how big our data set is. Here's the calculation of AIC, that's just this formula. And then, um, uh, so here's residual sum of squares for a first order polynomial, and here's for a second order polynomial. And we calculate ASC of 15.7 for the linear and 17.6 for the curve. And so the linear model wins. Okay. So you, and it's winning because you didn't get enough bang for your buck. Adding that extra parameter didn't explain enough of the variance to be worth it. Okay. And that's it. Okay, I think so. That's the last five minutes, and I've come to the end of, of a section. The rest of it, there's a different type of regression called logistic regression for doing dichotomous variables, and then a little thing on bootstrapping, which is just some simulation. Um, but as you can see, there's lots of 
explanatory text here, so you can go through it and, and feel free to email me with uh, questions if you have any. All right. Okay. So in the last five minutes, I would like uh, to give the opportunity to people to ask for more general questions instead of uh, particular questions about pandas or statistic statistical analysis. I don't know. Anyone? No? Um, about how much of the capability of R and its sort of associated e ecological infrastructure is now you know, able to be covered by um, Python and the, these sorts of modules such as uh, pandas, etc. Um, it, I guess it's just an approximation based on, on my experience, but the, the CRAN is huge. CRAN is the, the huge repository that most folks submit their statistical packages to for R. So I would say it's a small fraction, but all content is not made, is not created equal, right? So the important, much of the important stuff exists in Pandas, so generalized linear models, ordinary, ordinary least squares models, uh, all of the machine learning stuff uh, that is definitely part of statistical estimation that's in scikit-learn is there. Um, I create a Bayesian, one of a couple Bayesian packages for doing Bayesian analysis. Um, what you don't get <clears throat> in Python right now, uh, what you do get in, in R, are the very um, specific um, analyses, particularly new analyses that um, a, a scientist is able to um, generate right away when they publish a paper. So often you get a, a new method generated by a statistician and accompanying it will be R code that will be submitted to the CRAN for doing you know, a particular type of longitudinal data analysis that's censored, you know, very specific stuff. And, and so all that stuff, that's what R is great for. It's the community, the, the CRAN is all really good. Um, so to answer your question, the large chunks of the important stuff you'd get in a textbook is going to be there in either stats models or scikit's learn or associated ones. Some of the more esoteric stuff or some of the really, really new stuff won't be. Some more questions? In R, there is a, this a scatter, plot, scatter plot matrix. matrix. There is something similar in pandas or in Python? Yeah, so the lattice package in R or ggplot. Um, yeah, this is new stuff. This is in pandas. Um, there are R, inside pandas tools.rplot, you can get these really nice grid. So this is the Titanic data stuff, right? These are, what is this? Oh, this is, <laughs> this is uh, age distribution. Yeah, age distribution by class and gender. And then down here, we even fit polynomials to uh, this is the treatment effect stuff. Okay, so that's, yeah, we're getting it, slowly getting it, and this is in pandas. Some more? Yeah. I think that should be the last one. What's the frequency with which you, as a statistician, encounter uh, bugs in the code? Bugs in which code? Pandas? Um, uh, with decreasing frequency. And the, the stuff that I do encounter is usually um, um, pretty esoteric st stuff, corner cases. Uh, but it's very, um, Wes will brag about the coverage of his testing, unit testing code, and it's very, very good. So they get, you know, just go to GitHub and look in the issues page and you'll see the outstanding issues and it tends to be minor stuff. And, and, and then of course stuff associated with newer, you'll get anything that's new is going to have more bugs in it than stuff that's well established. But for the core stuff, I, you know, assuming I know how many bugs that is, you don't always know what bugs you hit, but it's extreme, Pandas is extremely solid. But uh, R, you know, R has, again, has the CRAN, but there's nothing in the, cr CRAN enforces things like documentation and a similar format for code and so on, but it doesn't, there's no quality control for it. There's nothing that uh, enforces that it has to 
produce sensible results. Seriously, it doesn't. I mean, you know, people won't use it if it's not any good. And you have, you know, you're supposed to have tests and stuff, but you know, there's no there's no statistician that goes through CRAN code and makes sure that it all does useful things. No, that's R. Sorry, I was sort of comparing it for R. Pandas is pandas. It's all on its own. CRAN is is a big repository where you get most of your R stuff from. No. No, there isn't for any of the open source stuff. No. You just have a lot of eyes looking at it, which for SAS you don't. OK, I think uh, we can close the tutorial here. Let's thank Chris for an amazing tutorial. <laughs>